James chapter 5, verse number 16, very familiar to your hearing, says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the good singing. Lord, I'm glad my sins are gone. And then, Lord, what an added blessing to see the Steckenbergers get up and sing, make me a servant. God, that ought to be all of our heart's desire, to be the servants. I've heard uh, the chief call on you many times of being the Most High King. And what a blessing to be a servant to the Most High King. Now, Father, thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for a good church. Thank you for the two testimonies that gave you praise for answering prayer. Lord, we realize the most powerful weapon on earth is prayer, and it is the least used. So help us tonight to grasp some insight on prayer and help us to become true prayer warriors in these last days that we might see many come to Christ. Lord, I do pray for Israel tonight, the peace of Israel, protect her. And I do pray for our president and our leaders that God you would uh, give them some common sense up there in D.C. And God, they would legislate and do what's right by the American people. And God, I certainly do pray for America. I pray for revival to break out in our land and that it might truly be a Christian nation once again. Bless now. Help us. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. So help us tonight, and we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice a few things about this verse. The first thing we notice that this verse uh, is teaching is confession. Uh, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another. Notice it does not say confess your sins. There's only one who can forgive sin, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I have no business uh, knowing anything about your sins. I can do nothing about it, but all that will cause me to do is become judgmental towards you. But we are to confess our faults. This is teaching transparency. When we admit that we have weaknesses and we have uh, things that are hindering us and we ask uh, uh, our church family to help us in these areas through the avenue of prayer... Uh, uh, the adage of what Paul said, when I'm weak, then am I strong, comes into play. When we are transparent and admit that something is bigger than us, uh, but it is not bigger than corporate us, uh, and it is certainly not bigger than God, we can then uh, truly be united uh, as God's people. We find confession, but we also find intercession. Look what it says. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that ye may be healed. We find that it is dealing with intercession, interceding one for another. There are times, and the choir sings that song uh, about prayer, and, and when you see me down, pray for me. Uh, there are times when you may be so low you can't even pray, but aren't you glad to be a part of a local church who knows how to pray? And what a blessing that we are to intercede one for another. You know, the Bible commands us to pray one for another. And it is a tremendous uh, a, a privilege to pray for somebody, but it is also very, very vital and important to the church's livelihood with this avenue of intercessory prayer. Prayer is where the power of God comes from. Yeah. Yet we don't utilize it enough. We see confession, we see intercession, then we see supplication. Notice what it says. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now I want to look at that last clause of this verse for a minute. Notice in this thought of supplication. Notice the prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer. Notice there's more to praying than just asking. It says the effectual, fervent prayer. This is a very powerful and agonizing prayer. If we're going to truly see God move, it's got to be much more than asking. It's got to be agonizing. There are many people that will mutter the words, but there's nothing behind it. 
we find that the effectual fervent prayer is what it takes to move the heart of God. Amen. We see the prayer, but notice uh, the one praying. It says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Now can I say tonight that you and I both know that in our own flesh there's none of us righteous, there's none of us that do good, there's no not one. But we do know that we are robed in His righteousness. And what gives us an avenue to the throne of God through the avenue of prayer is the fact that we've been made righteous in Jesus Christ. Uh, and being saved by the grace of God with our sins, Brother Clint, being gone, uh, we do have access to His throne. Uh, and we do, my dear friends, have the authority and the ability to go into the throne room through prayer. But when it talks about righteous here, it's talking about being in right standing. You see, if I have iniquity in my life, God won't hear my prayer. Yep. Amen. If I have sin in my life, God will not regard my prayer. So in order for my prayer to be effectual and fervent, uh, uh, something to have some power behind it, I have to be in right standing with God. Uh, a lot of people's prayers aren't answered because... They need to repent before they can pray. So we see that the prayer has to be an agonizing, powerful prayer. We see that the prayer has to be prayed by one who is in right standing with God. But then notice the productivity availeth much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, we live in a day and age where we see a lot of people asking, but we don't see much availing. Week in and week out, people request prayer for lost loved ones, and I know they really desire to see them saved, but yet we don't see them saved. Week in and week out, people pray and ask for revival, but yet we don't see true revival. Now, I read in the Bible where God's arm's not shortened that he cannot save. His ear's not inclined where he cannot hear. God is still well able to send revival. God is still able to save from the guttermost to the, uh, the uttermost. But why isn't anything availing? Folks have wayward folks request prayer for, or have been for years. How come we don't see them in the house of God? Amen. There's asking, and then there's availing. I want to preach with God's help just very briefly tonight on effective praying. Effective praying. If this is the most powerful tool in the universe, shouldn't we plug into it? And don't we need to be doing it properly? I mean, we have an example in this chapter where Elijah uh, prayed that it wouldn't rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years till he prayed. I haven't seen that kind of praying. So, we need to see some effective praying, do we not? The Bible says in the last days there will be a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. We have more preaching than any generation before us. And yet, we have less power and less results. Where's the disconnect? Well, there's a famine for hearing it. And I think there's a famine for praying for it. So let me give you some thoughts on effective praying. In order to pray effectively, can I say, first of all, one must have a burden. Amen. If you don't have a burden for something, your prayer is just idle words. Yeah. When somebody says, pray for me, and you say, oh, by the way, Lord, pray, for, you know, help so-and-so, you really didn't mean it. You don't have a burden for it. You know when the church had power? It was when people would ask prayer for something and, and the people of the church got a burden for that thing and they kept it before God. They'd stop, they'd stop service and just pray. They'd agonize with God in prayer till God moved. We don't agonize with God for anything. We get more upset if our ball team loses than we do if nobody gets saved in a service. Hmm? 
We get more upset if the price of gasoline goes up than we do if sinners don't get right with God. Hmm? After Sunday morning's message, the altar should have been filled with God's people agonizing for God to deal with sinners. Should have. But see, we're not geared toward that way because we don't have a burden. If we're going to learn to pray effectively, it begins with having a burden. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He went on to say if it were possible, he would that he would become accursed that they might be saved. In other words, Paul said if it was very possible, I'd die and go to hell for them to get saved. Now that's a burden. How could Paul be in prison? How could Paul be stoned? How could Paul be uh, uh, beaten with a cat of nine tails three different times? How could he endure all that? Because he had a burden. Yeah. Amen. That's true. You know why we have folks that <coughs> can't be faithful to God, can't pay their tithes, can't come back to church on Sunday night? Can't, they don't have a burden for the things of God. It's just that simple. You know, how in the world could God entrust this generation to go to jail for him, to be beaten for him, to be stoned for him when they can't even make it back to church on Sunday night? The early church couldn't even assemble openly. They'd have to meet in people's houses and go in hiding and uh, uh, meet in caves and dens. Uh, and yet they met because they had a burden for the things of God. Our burden is... What are we going to eat for dinner tonight? Yeah. See, we'll never truly embrace the awesome power of prayer until we get a burden that we need God. Yeah. Hmm. When your burden keeps you from sleep, you're getting somewhere. The last time there was great revival in America, there was a man by the name of Charles Grandison Finney who did a lot of the preaching. He preached in upstate New York and a million people got saved. That filtered down throughout uh, uh, the Midwest and the, and the revival lasted for over 18 months. And there's a lot of credit given to Finney. And by the way, Finney didn't believe the doctrines of the Bible properly. He didn't believe in eternal security. Say, how can a man who don't believe in eternal security get up preaching and a million people get saved? It had to be false. No. Nope. And people don't talk about two men by the name of Clary and Nash who were given to prayer. And they would get underneath Finney while he was preaching underneath the pulpit area and they would pray. They believed in order for God to answer their prayer, it had to come through Finney. Those million people got saved because people were given to prayer. They would show up weeks before Finney would show up and they would, they would lose sleep for days on end because they were under such a burden for people to be saved. We can't even get folks to come out for a full week of meetings because we have no burden. What we need to do is recognize we don't have a burden and ask God to break our hearts for sinners. Break our hearts for the things of God. Give us a heart like Jesus has to look at people and see the need and become broken. Can I say that song they said, Make me a servant? Do you know what really being Christ-like is? The same thing Jesus became, broken bread and poured out wine. When we become broken and poured out to this world, we will see a difference in this world. Good. Most people have the mentality, all there is to serving to God is coming to church. And when we have problems, make sure somebody's praying for it. If we're going to learn to pray effectively, we must have a burden. Can I say secondly, we must have a bond. If you never take ownership, it'll never mean anything to you. You must unite with what it takes to get a hold of God and become effectual and fervent. There must be a bond. 
And can I say we're all so busy, we all have so much going on. The only way we can truly bond and connect with one another is the only thing that really connects us, and that is the Spirit of God. The Bible says in 1 John 2.20, But ye have an unction from the Holy One. The Bible says in Romans 8.26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. If we're truly going to have power in our prayer, we've got to learn to submit ourselves to the will of the Spirit of God indwelling us. A lot of times our prayer life is nothing more than rushing into our prayer uh, uh, with, uh, Lord, this is what I need, this, Lord, help this, Lord, do this. We don't take time to sit back and wait for the Spirit of God to call us to prayer. Many times throughout our day, the Spirit of God will even speak to us about praying for something and we won't take time we'll grieve him and quench him and we won't take time to listen to him I remind you anytime the spirit of God is speaking to you is because God wants to use you in a circumstance maybe nothing more than to pray for a brother or sister in Christ maybe to pick up a phone and talk to somebody maybe mean to get in your car and go see somebody if the spirit of God is wanting to use you that means he's working on the other end but we must have a bond and we must become sensitive to what God wants. Our prayer lives would be a whole lot different if we come in before God into the throne room and say, Okay, God, you now tell me what I need to pray for. We already have it all made up in our minds what we need. I remind you, you don't even know what your own heart is capable of. God knows what you need. And when you learn to pray what God's will is for you, you will become an effectual, fervent prayer warrior for God. You must have a burden and you must have a bond. If we're to really pray effectively, we must become broken. It's one thing to have a burden for something. It's another thing to be broken over it. It's one thing to really uh, be hit in our heart for somebody. It's another thing to be broken over somebody. We could see somebody grieving in our midst and we could have a burden for them, but if you're not the one grieving, you don't know what brokenness is. But when we become broken, truly broken, over folks not getting saved, uh, uh, over folks not getting right with God, over folks not getting the help they need from God, over folks not getting the touch they need from God, then we'll see business pick up. I'm reminded of the greatest example of brokenness in prayer through a lady by the name of Hannah. You know the story. She couldn't have children. 1 Samuel 1.10, the Bible says, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Can I say, the man of God, he came in and thought she was drunk. She was so tore up. I remind you, the very thing she asked for, she gave to God. Yes, sir. And he went on to be the greatest high priest Israel ever knew. All born, not out of a barren womb, but out of a broken heart. And when we truly become broken, we will have a burden. Yes, sir. And when we truly become broken, we'll see some of these prayer requests come to fruition. We'll see waywards and prodigals come home. I'm working on something that uh, I want to reach out to some folks that used to come and are no longer come, and I'm going to ask you to get involved in the days and weeks to come. I trust that you will. Uh, but until we really get broken, we're not going to see any changes. That's why we don't see change in revival meetings. That's why we don't see changes in people's lives because we don't see brokenness. God help us to become effective prayers. Effective prayer warriors. Getting a burden. I read something today and really got under con conviction. Because I tend to be a procrastinator by nature. 
Many of us are. We wait till the last minute and they want to get it done. But this made it very plain and clear. We only have so many seconds in a day and so many days in this world. And are we taking full advantage of the time we have for the cause of Christ? You've heard me say many a times, a hundred years from now, it won't matter. The only thing that's going to matter is what you did for God. Amen. But how about ten days from now, it's not going to matter. How about two days from now, it's not going to matter. Sure. All that's going to matter is what we did for God. That's right. You've got a certain amount of number of days. Yeah. How many of them do you really give to God? See, we all know we're going to stand before Him. We just don't think we're going to stand before Him today. But I ask you, what is today any different than a month ago? How much more have you done for God in the last month than you're doing today? None. Because we get in these patterns and these habits of life. And they're geared around everything but Christ. And we wonder why we don't see effective change going on around us. Must have a burden. Must have a bond. Must be broken. Can I say this? If we're going to pray effectively, must be prayed in boldness. You've got to have boldness when you pray. Can I just go on a little... Sidetrack, chase a rabbit, whatever you want to call it right here, because some of you are about to pass out. Because I know it's a weighty message. You know something I got a real problem with? Wimpy men that can't make a stand. I got a problem with that. Right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm going to stand up for something. Sure. Know what I'm saying? I got a real problem for a man that won't stand up and be a man. Why do you think the Apostle Paul said, quit you like men? In other words, he's saying, stand up and be a man. Well, if I feel that way, how do you think God feels when he made a man to be a man? Sure. Hmm? You show me a little sissy man whose wife runs him around. Oh my. I'm thinking, dude, be a man. Don't be abusive to your wife. Don't be nasty to your wife. Love your wife. But be a man. You know what every wife really wants? Her husband to be a man. Thank you, Brother Tommy. No? Huh? That's what God made men to be. But even ladies of God can be bold in prayer. Because you've been made a child of God. You've been robed in His righteousness. You've been justified by faith. You are a joint heir to the throne of God. So when it comes to this thing of prayer, why do we act like we're big sissies in approaching God? He is our Heavenly Father. He's paid for your sin. He loves you with a love that you can't even conceive of, and He's loved you for all of eternity, and He has given you great privilege and access, and He says, here it is. Now come and ask. And we want to go in a back door. If I can't stand a sissified man, what do you think about God? When he looks at his children and said, I told you to come boldly. And you come in sheepishly. No wonder he don't answer our prayers. Hmm? Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says this in 1 John 3. For if our heart condemn us, uh-oh, that might be why we can't go boldly. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. 
And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. See, if we are in right standing, as this verse tells us, we ought to have confidence towards God, and anything we ask of him, we'll receive of him. The Bible goes on in Hebrews 4, 16. I alluded to it a second ago. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God help us to learn if we're going to be an effective pray, pray, prayer or prayer warrior, we need to do it boldly. God wants us to come before Him in humility but boldly ask for those things we have a burden about, those things we're broken about. We recognize that without God, nothing's going to happen to, in this situation, but we do recognize that God is able to do all things. That's being bold, having confidence in God, and being humble, saying, God, I can't do anything about this. This thing's bigger than me, but it's not bigger than you. And God, I'm giving it to you and being bold before God. God hears that kind of prayer. Do you think Elijah said, now God, I know Jezebel's really powerful. And it's looking really bleak. But God, if you could just stop the heavens for just a little while. No, I don't believe he prayed that way. I read what he prayed when he prayed fire down. He prayed confidently. He prayed boldly. And he prayed in humility. And he prayed for God to get glory, and God did. But we've got to learn to pray boldly. And the reason many times we don't is because we no, deep down in our heart there's something not right with God hmm? when we truly have confidence in God because our heart is not condemned of God then my dear friends we can pray boldly let me say this lastly if we are to pray effectively we must believe Many times our prayers are not answered because we don't really believe God's going to answer them. Well, why take the time to pray? Why waste God's time? Amen. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Yes. James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea that is driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. You've got to ask in faith, nothing wavering. James 4. Verse 2, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot attain, ye fight and war and ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lust. Uh, ye have not, because ye ask not. Because you don't believe God can, and that God will. God help us to believe. I have no doubt. I ask you to raise your hand that you believe that the Lord saved you. You raise your hand that you believe he saved you because he said he would. And how come you can't believe that God can answer your prayers? Sure. If he's a big enough God to save you, he's also a big enough God to answer your prayers. Amen. See, we can believe him for our eternity. We just can't believe him to help us today. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Powerful, agonizing prayer of somebody in right standing with God gets things done. God help us to learn to pray effectively. I tell my Sunday school class, and I've mentioned it from behind the pulpit, I'd rather you read one verse a day and understand and grasp and practice that verse than to read 40 chapters and not have any idea what you read. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Amen. I'd rather you learn to pray effectively over one simple thing than to pray a prayer list for three hours and never get nothing done. 
God help us to pray effectively. God help us to make a difference, make an impact. God help us to truly learn to yield to the Spirit of God and pray prayers that changes people's lives. And when God answers prayer, let's learn to truly praise Him for what He's done. As bold as we pray for it, let's be that bold in our worship of God. Let's not be hesitant and say, Bless God, I ask you to pray. Somebody touched heaven, and look what God did. God help us to truly believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. That word diligently seek is much like effectual fervent. God help us to put all we got into it and expect God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So, on this Wednesday night of prayer meeting, I wonder how much effective prayer have we really done. God help us to learn to pray effectively and it will change folks' lives all around us. God help our church be known as truly an effectively praying church. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, I'm glad you're a God that hears and answers prayer. God, I'm glad you don't just accidentally answer prayer. You answer deliberate prayer. And God, you have commanded us and invited us to come to you through the avenue of prayer. God, help us to learn these simple truths and to put them into practice that we might be able to impact the lives of folks around us by interceding, by supplicating, and even by confessing that we might see lives changed. Help us not to pray with vain repetitions and babblings, but God, help us to pray effectively and fervently. Help us to pray in boldness and help us, Lord, to pray, believing that you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Lord, you said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. Help us, Lord, to truly become effective prayers in these days. Bless this invitation now. Speak to hearts, and we'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we do ask these things. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.